Welcome and good evening. Thank you for joining us today for the Regents Lecture, Disrupting Ableism in Higher Education and Beyond. My name is Lauren Clark and I'll be the host and moderator this evening. I'm Professor and Shapiro Family Endowed Chair in Developmental Disability Studies and Nursing in the UCLA School of Nursing. I'm a woman in my 50s with curly gray hair, round blue glasses, and tonight I'm wearing a blue sweater. And I'm joining you from my living room in sunny Southern California where it's about 80 degrees this evening. I'd like to thank the many people who have made tonight's event possible, including Ralph and Shirley Shapiro and their family who endowed a chair in Developmental Disability Studies and Nursing. And it's my pleasure to be sitting in that chair at this time. I'd also like to thank the Regents of the University of California who funded this Regents Lectureship. The UCLA Strategic Communications team, the website developers, students, and leaders in our diversity, equity, and inclusion areas from all across campus helped to make this event and the week's events possible. They've been both purposeful and important. Thank you, too, to Disability Studies, the Tarjan Center, and the Disabled Student Union for leading segments of this week's activities. Live captioning will be turned on for this event. You may turn it off by using the CC button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. ASL interpretation will be available throughout the duration of the event as well. Thanks to our CART provider, Lana. And let me introduce our ASL interpreters, Fern and Mara. After I introduce our speakers this evening, we'll enjoy 45 minutes to an hour of conversation and I'll moderate that discussion. And then we're going to entertain some of the questions that you submit for the next 30 minutes or so. During the event, you can take this conversation to social media and use the hashtag disrupting ableism when posting about this virtual event. Within the webinar, we have enabled chat, so you can participate in a running dialogue through the use of the chat function. Please refrain from submitting questions in the chat function though because we have a special way to do questions, and that would be by selecting the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Questions you submit will only be visible to the webinar leaders, not to the entire group of participants. We will ask the participants tonight as many of the questions that are submitted as we can during the Q&A period at the end of the program. After this webinar concludes, We'll be posting a recording of the Regents Lecture on the UCLA YouTube channel, and that's for public access. I wanted to note it may take a day or two for that to be concluded. By way of background, the Regents Lectures at UCLA are designed to invigorate life and learning on campus. To do this, we invite a public figure or two to discuss topics of social significance. The point is to engage our students, our faculty, and the community at large in this important dialogue. And so to that end, the conversation tonight is focused on disrupting ableism in higher education. So why is this a conversation of significance? The Centers for Disease Control estimates that 26% of adults living in the United States have some type of disability. Tonight's speakers will discuss disability civil rights, disability and human flourishing and disability in higher education. And we're also going to be connecting those topics to the mission of higher education. And how are we doing in higher education at disrupting ableism? The University of California system has been slow, um, but, but it has been making progress. We've begun to recognize students and faculty who identify as having disabilities. Inclusion and equity in campus life for disabled, neurodivergent, and chronically ill participants is as yet an, an incomplete effort. So we're here tonight to address the change that needs to happen here and on campuses throughout the country. In meeting with Judy this week, she challenged me to share with you all why I wanna host this conversation. And I have to say part of it is completely personal. I wanna hear what our speakers have to say, and I want to be, um, a part of this dialogue. It's kind of like planning a party with people you want to talk to. 
After raising children with disabilities, I've seen ableism diminish their opportunities and their chance to excel. And that's happened in education and employment settings as well. So I personally relish this conversation to make education more accessible and accountable. And I wanted a front row seat. Another reason why I wanted to host tonight's event is that I'm a nurse educator. And it's important to me that we in nursing and in the health professions admit more disabled students. We help them get through our programs like all of our students so that they can then leave and make a contribution to the profession and to patient care. I also want the non-disabled students in our profession to learn alongside students with disabilities. And I want our curriculum to be focused and pertinent to address the lifespan perspective on disability across the human experience of health and illness. So from admissions to classrooms to inclusivity, we can be much better than we are today. To lead us in our discussion tonight, it's now my honor to introduce the Regents lecturer, Ms. Judy Ewan. Judy is a lifelong advocate for the rights of disabled people. She's been instrumental in the development and implementation of legislation such as Section 504 and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Perhaps like me, you've already read and been entertained by her memoir, Being Human, an Unrepentant Memoir of a Disability Rights Activist. That was published in 2020. She's also featured quite prominently in the Oscar nominated documentary, Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution. Judy produces a podcast called The Human Perspective, and that features a variety of members from the disability community. Judy serves on a number of nonprofit boards, including the American Association of People with Disabilities, the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, Humanity and Inclusion, and the Human Rights Watch. She has 20 years of nonprofit experience working with various disability organizations. She was a founding member of the Berkeley Center for Independent Living, and she served in prominent positions in both the Clinton administration and the Obama administration. Judy, would you please say hello and offer a visual description before I introduce the other speakers? Thank you so much, Lauren. <clears throat> hello, everybody. Um, as Lauren said, my name is Judy Human. I am a 74-year-old white disabled woman. Uh, we are in my husband's and my apartment in Washington, DC. I have red glasses and earrings and my hair is like shoulder length. I'm wearing a blue shawl and a blouse that's um, kind of like feathered, uh, white and blue and sea green. Welcome, Judy. Joining us uh, are two additional conversation partners tonight. Mr. Andy Imperato is here. Um, Andy began work in February of 2020 as the Executive Director of Disability Rights California. He joined DRC after an important career in Washington, DC in disability advocacy and policy. DRC is the federally funded legal services agency that serves Californians with all disabilities across the age spectrum. While in Washington, Andy worked on the staff for Tom Harkin in the US Senate. He served as CEO of the American Association of People with Disabilities. He was the executive director of the Association of University Centers on Disability as well. Since joining the DRC, Andy's worked in coalitions to prioritize vaccination of high-risk people with disabilities. He's also improved vital programs and services for people with disabilities and older adults by preventing discrimination on the basis of disability and age during the pandemic. A year ago, President Biden appointed Andy to the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. And you may know that that task force developed recommendations for the White House COVID-19 response team to advance equity during this ongoing pandemic and in preparation for future pandemics. His perspective is informed by his lived experience with bipolar disorder. Andy, would you please say hello and offer a visual description before I introduce Vivian? Sure. Hi, hi, Lauren. This is Andy Imperato, and hi to the audience. I am a 56-year-old white man with short hair and glasses. I have a blurred background. I'm coming to you today from Sacramento, which is a little bit cooler than Los Angeles, but it's also a pretty day here. And I have on a vest that um, 
looks kind of like chain mail to me. It's a, it's a dark blue vest and I have a white button down shirt underneath it and I'm delighted to be here. Oh, I'm so delighted you're able to join us. Let me now introduce uh, our final of the three participants in tonight's discussion. I'd like to introduce you to Vivian Hahn. Vivian's experiences advocating for her brother, Brian, who has autism, sparked her passion for inclusion, equity, and disability issues. After obtaining a master's degree in education administration and policy analysis from Stanford University and a law degree from UCLA's School of uh, Law in public interest law and policy, Vivian worked in special education law and policy for several years. Vivian is currently a senior attorney in Disability Rights California, where she focuses on legislative, budget, and other policy issues affecting people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Vivian, would you like to say hello? Thank you, Lauren. It's so good to be here. Um, my name is Vivian Han. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am an Asian American woman. I have long hair. I wear glasses. I'm currently wearing a brown and black dress. I am seated in the corner of my bedroom in my home here in Los Angeles, just a stone's throw away from Dodger Stadium, where uh, during baseball season, I can usually hear it. Uh, I can tell when there's a home run or something's going well, because I can hear the noise of the crowd floating through my window. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here with you all today. Wonderful. Well, with introductions taken care of, I'd like to uh, turn to uh, Judy and say to start out with, I think you can tell from the chat, um, and from your week here at UCLA, how appreciative we are of your important role in the fight to implement Section 504 in the 1970s, the role that you played thereafter, and the role you continue to play in the disability movement. And so to start with a, a question about that, what would you say has been the greatest accomplishment of the disability movement to date? You may want to unmute your microphone. This is Judy speaking. Um, thank you for the question. I would say that some of the greatest accomplishments we've made is an expanding cross-disability rights movement, which is not only working uh, cross disability, but is also working in coalition with other organizations involved in civil and human rights issues. Um, we have, as a result of that work, I think had many accomplishments, uh, both at the federal level and at the state level. And I think California really is an example of the leadership that it has played for many decades. <clears throat> Sorry. For example, in the independent living movement, uh, in work that's gone on in the area of developmental disabilities, uh, the Disability Rights Center, uh, DREDOF, and other groups where I think tangibly some of the outcomes that we can see most recently are with the COVID uh, pandemic and how many organizations in the state came together to really uh, fight against both federal and state potential uh, rules and regulations that would have dramatically adversely affected disabled people. So I think unity is very important. And I also want to say right now, um, the LA Community College District um, is, um, is seriously considering bringing a lawsuit that would come before the Supreme Court that would dramatically uh, rip apart the heart of 504 and the ADA. And what we are seeing both in California and around the country are protests where um, people are really working with LACCD to allow them to understand the dramatic harm that they could cause for disabled people around the United States. And quite frankly, it's not just the United States because countries around the world look to the United States on what we do in developing our laws and implementing our laws. So we are encouraging them to withdraw. 
You know, I know that Vivian and Andy both work, yeah. uh, obviously, in uh, disability rights and law in California. What would you two say might be other examples of discrimination against disabled people in higher education right now? Uh, Vivian, any thoughts? Thank you so much, Lauren and Judy. Um, there are so many things happening uh, in this space right now. Um, one of the most basic and fundamental things uh, we know just has to start with, with accessibility, with basic accessibility, which um, feels like it's been a long time and it shouldn't be quite so basic, but it still is, you know, we're talking about accessibility to classrooms, to campuses, so physical accessibility to different facilities. We're also talking about accessibility to programs, right, to curriculum. Um, and we're also talking about representation throughout higher education, meaning not just in the student body, um, where I think many people tend to start, but if we look at faculty, staff, positions of power and authority, I think we very often see that while strides have been made um, in, in diversity and diverse representation at those levels um, with regard to race, race, ethnicity, gender, and so many other um, justice movements, that disability is often still just not as visible. It's not foregrounded. So I think there's um, a lot of different ways where we can start talking about that this evening. Lauren, if I could chime in, this is Andy, if I could chime in on both of your questions. First, on the question of what has been our biggest accomplishment as a movement, I want to kind of amplify a little bit of what I think Judy was getting at. I think one of our biggest challenges as a movement has been how we define disability. We've had big fights in the Supreme Court about that. We've had fights in other forums about that. And the disability movement globally has always come back to a broad, inclusive definition of disability that is more of a political definition than a medical one. And I think as long as we can define disability for ourselves as a movement, we will be an inclusive movement that, as Judy said, is ever, ever expanding and ever growing. And I'm proud of our movement for hanging together around a broad definition of disability. As, as you mentioned in my introduction, I have bipolar disorder. Throughout my 30 years working in disability rights, I have always felt welcomed by the disability movement in the United States and globally as a person with bipolar disorder. And when I was hired to be the head of AAPD, I think the board understood that they were making a statement and hiring somebody with a non-visible disability for a very visible role at that, at that moment in our movement. Um, and then to the question of higher ed, I just wanna lift up what's going on around inclusive higher education for students with intellectual disabilities. There, there's been a movement to try to open up higher education. And I know UCLA is part of this for students with intellectual disabilities. And as you can imagine, it hasn't always been embraced by some institutions of higher education. The students with intellectual disabilities haven't always had access to the general curriculum. They haven't always had access to housing or other features that are part of the college experience. So my hope is that over time, universities will realize that having students with intellectual disabilities participate fully in all aspects of the university experience is going to improve the education experience for everyone at that university. And you know, to the extent that higher education is ableist, one of the ways that it's ableist is this idea that we are for the best and the brightest. And if you're not bright, whatever that means, then this institution is not the right place for you. And I think that's a very kind of narrow and ableist and dangerous definition of who is worthy to participate in higher education. So I think this movement of opening up college to students with intellectual disabilities is really positive and I'm hopeful that it will grow over time. If, if I could add just a comment to that. Um, I, I completely agree and I applaud and I'm so grateful for the UC system and, and the um, 
the strides that they have made recently. I want to call attention to a relatively new program that's really exciting at UC Davis, the Seed Scholar Program, uh, which um, I think has, has had its first cohort just this past year. Um, it's really exciting because it is, um, it is an all inclusive, and I mean that in every sense of the word program for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they are so integrated into the life of that campus. Um, and it is it's very exciting to have that here in the state of California. I also wanted to mention something in talking to some of the people who were putting that program together and working with the university to, to build it, they started talking to other state university systems, right, and other states who had done this before. Um, they talked to one university in Texas that had started a similar program, right, and one of the great aspects of programs like, like these is that they had a residential component. So they had students with intellectual and developmental disabilities living in the dorms, right, along with every other student, um, which was fantastic. And uh, one of the students in that program hit it off with some of the other, other people in their dorm, became friends. And the next year they wanted to become roommates. They wanted to move off campus, get an apartment together, right? As you do when you're a college student. But when that student, the, the one with intellectual and developmental disabilities told their program about it, staff at the university were like, I don't know, right? Like that, mm, I think you, you might need to stay here on campus. We hadn't really contemplated that. It would be safer for you to stay here on campus, right? Because that's, that's how we conceived of the program, which I thought was a very ironic uh, consequence or response to this very organic outgrowth, right? Of this is what I think we wanted to have happen when we brought students with intellectual and developmental disabilities into the residence halls on campus. So I think there's sometimes ways in which programs that start out well-intentioned, um, you know, can ultimately end up doing things that, I don't know, may need to be looked at a little carefully, right? It can be complex. Those, that's a really good example, Vivian, of uh, where higher education could do better, where we can uh, take good programs and make them better. But let me circle back. Um, Judy, I'm not sure if everyone understands. You mentioned how part of Section 504 could be gutted by the LA Community College District. Um, I wonder if everyone here is up to speed with that. I know I'm not. Um, could you perhaps or maybe Andy elaborate on what's involved in that case? Sure, I think both of us can do it. Um, basically, there has been, <clears throat> from the beginning of 504 and the ADA, a presumption that discrimination is not based on intentional discrimination. So if you don't build a ramp and you're violating the standards, there are people who are adversely being affected even though you didn't know each individual name of a person who might be adversely affected. And so um, that's really the crux of this. Um, intentional discrimination is what um, LCCD and some others have been trying to do, which would uh, result in their not having the same um, requirements. And if, uh, one alleged discrimination uh, based on disability, they, the entity would be able to come back and say, there was no intent in discrimination. Andy, you wanna add anything to that? Sure, thanks, Judy, this is Andy. Um, so Lauren, as you may know, the case involves two students who were blind, who sued the LA Community College District, which is the largest community college system in the country for not providing accessibility for them as blind students. And they were joined by the National Federation of the Blind uh, organizationally. And they won in the trial court and they won in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And now the, the community college district is thinking about appealing this case to the Supreme Court and arguing to the Supreme Court that they should be allowed to discriminate against blind students as long as they're not doing it intentionally. So, if they buy a technology system that doesn't work for blind students 
as long as they didn't deliberately exclude the blind students, they shouldn't be liable under the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's a ridiculous argument. The fact that it's coming from a progressive system in Los Angeles that prides itself on its commitment to equity and diversity is embarrassing. And the fact that we're having to have a, a public fight with them about it is ridiculous. So my hope is that they're going to realize that it's not a good idea to give this United States Supreme Court an opportunity to say that unintentional discrimination is perfectly fine under federal civil rights laws. And I think it's ableism at its worst. Thanks for filling in those details. Um, it, it is disheartening for sure. And I think part of why we're here tonight is to have a hard conversation. And I, and I don't mind saying that UCLA is up for considering where we can do better as well. Let me start by saying that Judy's been with us all week and she's had a chance to meet students, faculty, be in different groups of people and get to know us a little bit. And I wanna brag for just a moment and tell you that according to US News and World Report, UCLA is the number one public university in the United States. And I think that's incredible. I also want to say UCLA is the most applied to university in the United States. And last year alone, we had over 100,000 applications submitted by students who want to come to this university. Now, there are no rankings that I'm aware of for inclusion for disabled students on campus. And so the, the question for Judy, who's been here observing for a while, is what would it take for UCLA to be the number one university that welcomes a diverse disabled community of students. Where are we and where do you think we need to go to get there? I don't know that I can give you a complete report card, but um, it seems to me that you're doing some very good things by moving from a minor in disability studies to a major in disability studies. One of the reasons why I call that out is because the, um, Disability Studies major will also be interdisciplinary. And I think that's very important to show that uh, different uh, colleges across the university are recognizing the importance of inclusion of disability in the work that they're doing. I also know that UCLA, like other schools around the United States, who are almost 40 years into 504, still are doing things that I think if the most senior people understood some of the things that were going on on campus, they would be embarrassed. So one of the students who told me about a policy which was being changed, he's, uh, he needs his textbooks um, put in audio and he was able to get his textbooks put in audio format um, in a timely way. So. When school started, he had the materials that he needed, but there was some policy change that was being made that was going to only allow him to get some of his books done in a timely way. Um, that luckily was caught by a lawyer on campus and that has been reversed. But I think speaking to faculty and staff and students and finding out what areas um, they are experiencing discrimination and in a campus and university the size of UCLA, discrimination is something that will be occurring for a variety of reasons. But the extent, the, the question really is, from the perspective of disability, are there systemic issues that are going on, like the one I was just discussing, um, like the issue of having appropriate captioning so that people who need the captioning are able to get authentic captioning and not captioning, which is uh, not being typed in, but is audio. Whereas we know tonight the captioning is being done correctly, but when it's just done on Zoom software or Google, there are many, many mistakes. And if you're doing this for classroom, then it can really totally adversely affect your ability to get the information that you need to do well in class. But I think at the end of the day, it's really, <clears throat> doing an inventory with faculty, staff, and students, and looking at what people are saying still needs to be done and having um, a plan in place where we can, you can measure the progress which is being made 
and be able to be quite public about both the barriers that existed and how they are falling down. Andy or Vivian, have you got any um, ideas about best practices or lapses that we should be aware of? Vivian, you want to go first? Okay. Um, this is Andy. You know, Lauren, one thing I just want to lift up is my disability kicked in during my last semester of law school. That's when I had my first serious episode of depression, which en ended up settling into a pattern that got diagnosed with bipolar disorder. But I feel like one of the things that universities can do is introduce students to the world of disability and disability identity where they understand as they acquire a disability identity that they're connected to a rich and diverse movement, that they have rights, that they uh, have a culture, and that you know one of the things they need to learn as an adult navigating this new identity, or in some cases, lifelong identity, is how to navigate it in a way that it doesn't hold them back, how, how to keep their expectations high, how to ask for what they need at work, how to find uh, partners and friends who appreciate and love them, uh, not in spite of their disability, but love their disability as part of them. So I just think that whole idea of identity development is something that happens for lots of people in lots of ways as part of higher education and helping people adjust to a new disability identity to me is an important thing that can happen at colleges and universities. This is Judy, and if I could, continue on what Andy is saying. So one point I think that's very important is that he was identified in his last semester of the university. And if Andy had been going to a school where uh, whatever, uh, however it was, um, however he was experiencing his disability, it could have meant that he would not have been able to complete his studying um, in a timely way. I also feel that what Andy is saying is right on the money because partly what universities should be doing is helping disabled students um, organize the cultural center that I know the students are trying to get, I think is very important. More and more universities as they get cultural centers are getting a cultural center on disability. And I know that's something that the students and alumni I think feel is also very important. Um, but I also want to say that there are many people on campus, campuses, I'm not picking at UCLA, who are uh, faculty, staff, and students who may be acquiring various disabilities while they're in school and afterwards. So to the extent that disability is truly being integrated into the teaching and learning that's going on, it also helps people look at disability, as Andy's also been discussing, it's a natural, normal part of life. We need to be respected and loved for who we are. And uh, we need to be able to look at what our own biases are, what we bring to the table, and how to address those. You know, I was teaching students this week in a, a care work disability studies, uh, disability justice course. And the students said in the process of getting to know um, people with disabilities and community agencies where we're partnering for the course. They said one of the first things they learned was they initially had flattened their the identity into kind of the disability. And they're like, there's, there's so much more here. And I thought what an incredible opportunity for students to encounter that and learn early, especially if they're going into the health professions, that people are not defined by the disability. And part of appreciation is that whole person perspective that you mentioned, Judy. Um, Vivian, did you want to say something about um, about what we can do better? And Vivian, especially UCLA Law School, I think it'd be interesting to hear about your experience there. Well, sure. Uh, thank you. I can I can talk a little bit about both. I would completely echo what Andy just said about creating spaces where disability ident identity can be um, cultivated, safe spaces where people can gather and find community. Um, 
there's so much, I think, still stigma and shame um, that many of us don't even realize we deeply internalize from maybe from the way that we've been raised or the cultures or the communities, the backgrounds we grew up in, I think particularly around non-visible disabilities, disabilities that are acquired later in life. Um, these are things where people still feel like they, they struggle and they struggle alone and don't know how to talk about it. So I think everything that Andy just said um, would be a tremendous start. You know, things as simple as having, you know, um, groups, organizations, clubs, just to start building a sense of community and collective and shared power. Um, those are always, I think, excellent places to start. Um, with regard to my experience at uh, the law school at UCLA, it was a while ago. Um, and I know that, that I think a lot has changed in the meantime. I saw that um, there was a disability law journal, I think at least one or maybe a couple of issues that came out that a number of you know, really um, enterprising law students were able to put together and publish a journal that focused specifically and entirely on disability law issues, um, which I give them tremendous kudos for. That's not something that I had available to me when, when I was in law school. Um, and I think that, it was different for me when I was in law school because at that time, I didn't identify as a person with a disability. Um, I, I struggled in a lot of ways, but at that time I didn't have a, a diagnosis. It wasn't until about five years ago uh, that I was diagnosed as having ADHD um, and generalized anxiety disorder, which, um, which changed a lot of things for me. Right, because I was someone who had worked in the disability field, um, but had not identified that you know as a person with a disability. People with disabilities were were like it, disability for me. I was not the subject. If that makes sense, right? Um, I was still doing things for people with disabilities. I was supporting them. I was working with them to be part of that community and that group really changed things for me later, right? That was outside of law school. I know you asked about law school, Andy, but I just can't underscore enough how much that, that changes the way we think about things. I think that also has to do a little bit with some of the other, um, other questions and issues that we're thinking about tonight because when we think about why disability often isn't included in diversity and equity discussions or initiatives, I think that that's a big part of it. The sense that disability is still something that happens to other people. There's still very much a charity model where we are trying to be kind to people with disabilities, to make the world nicer for people with disabilities. Um, and sometimes you know, inclusion is great, but sometimes it's much more about just being nice to people and being kind as opposed to recognizing their full humanity and their power, right? And, and having them, um, you know, just be as fully human, <laughs> right? As, as everybody else um, that has its roots in the medical model of disability as well, right? All of this ties together. So um, I'm sorry, I've gotten way far afield from the initial prompt, but I hope that gets at, at, at some, of the, uh, some of the issues. No, I, I really appreciate where this is going because the conversation has brought up everything from a cultural center to a disability studies major, the, the programs that you mentioned like SEED, here we have a UCLA pathway program for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, law journals, the concept of access and the concept of intentional access. Um, I wonder if, if there are best practices or models that we could think of, um, that we could apply to do even better? Like what more could we do? If anyone has a thought about that. I mean, Lauren, let me bring up an experience I had when I visited the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, which is known for their inclusive sports programs and having a well-funded and large 
disabled student center um, that that do more than just think about or handle accommodations for students on campus, although that's part of what they do. But I remember meeting with the former president of the university. They had a dinner one of the nights I was there. And he said that the commitment to students with disabilities was the most important thing that his university did that he was most proud of having served as president of the university. And, and for him, that was very real. Like he, he was moved by it. It's changed him as a leader. And it was the thing that he wanted people to know about his university. So if we could get, whether it's the chancellor or whoever the highest ranking person is for UCLA, get them to have that same feeling about UCLA's commitment to students with disabilities academically, to faculty with disabilities, to staff, to you know, having inclusive sports programs, to having the major, but to really have it as a differentiator. So UCLA now is not just bragging that you're the number one public university, but that you are the best university in the world, public or private, for students with disabilities and faculty and staff, and that you, you've, you know, you've, you've resourced it. You've figured out how to do that, how to put the resources to make that happen. That to me is the aspiration. You know, I think um, University of Illinois Champaign, uh, they were the first or second university in the United States after the Second World War to really welcome disabled veterans. And sports was one of the main areas that they excelled in. And I think the example that Andy's giving is great. Um, I also feel that one way of showing uh, leadership is that the UC system itself needs to also, and I'm gonna bring up um, the LA uh, CCD again, because LA CCD's actions don't just reflect on community colleges in California. They reflect on the whole public education system. And in my mind, uh, the chancellor for, UC, uh, for the UC system needs to be weighing in publicly or privately, but what is being approached is really heinous. And I don't think anyone should look at it as anything else. So for me, it's leadership and it's leadership across the board. And it means that the leadership of the UC system and all the deans across the board uh, need really to be speaking with faculty, staff, and students, understanding the progress that's been made and what more needs to happen and in putting forth a plan that people can in fact measure as progress is being made. You know, Judy, I think, and Andy, th this uh, goal and this vision of where we could go is really inspiring, but I can almost sense that there would be some, some resistance in the sense that, hey, wait, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Like, come on, we can't do this right now. We have things going on. Uh, but I think there is in some ways a paradoxical experience where the pandemic has actually highlighted and heightened our awareness of the need for accessible education. So um, Andy, you're on the COVID task force and inform the White House on such things. When it comes to mental health or um, disability in the pandemic, how do you see that intersection potentially um, informing a more rapid or more pertinent response? Well, let me give an example of how um, clinicians and academic settings were incredibly helpful to us during the pandemic. We, we had a fight with the California Department of Public Health around healthcare rationing, where they came out with guidelines that said it was okay to not give somebody a ventilator if they were basically too old or too disabled to benefit from it. It was better to give the ventilators to people that would have a better quality of life or a better shot at you know, having a good life, whatever that means after the intervention. And you know, we met with the Secretary of Health and Human Services for California, Dr. Mark Galley. And there were a group of us, Claudia Center from the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund. But most of the people there were clinicians who agreed with the, the disability rights lawyers and the disabled people who were at the table 
And they said to Dr. Galley, as a fellow doctor, this is not good medicine. There's no scientific justification for what you came up with. And you need to listen to these disabled people. So, you know, sometimes the, the academy, if they're on the side of God and justice, can get through to people who did well in the academy in a way that some of us can't. So I just, I think there's lots of ways that researchers can support the position that are taken by disability leaders and bring their research skills to make the case in a way that we can't always make the case. And if they ignore us as a subject of research, then we have a harder time making our case like we did with vaccine prioritization, where we had a huge public fight to get California to prioritize people under 65 who were high risk. We should not have had that fight, but we had it in part because we didn't have enough data to show how we were doing during the pandemic because researchers were ignoring us. So I think there's lots of ways that universities can lock arms with the disability movement and bring your skills, your gravitas, your disciplines to support our goals. I really want to underscore um, what I said in the very beginning and how it links to what Andy is saying. 10 years ago, it would have been unlikely that you could have pulled together the number of people that you did from universities and other places to be able to be persuasive um, at the state level with the Department of Public Health. So again, I think it is so urgent that we continue to educate disabled individuals, including disability as a part of the studies and work that's going on, not only in the healthcare field, but we can discuss that right now because we're looking at COVID. Um, to recognize that we have much more power than we did before. And it really is before, because of the learning and the ability to bring more disabled people um, to the table who are knowledgeable, uh, like Andy, you know, who can play at many, many different tables, knows many, many people that we can bring in and bring to the forefront. So. We need to complement ourselves on the progress that we've made, look at what we have not yet been able to do and continue to move forward to make more progress. You know, Judy, that's just so eloquent. And it reminds me of what you said maybe an hour, hour and a half ago to the Disabled Student Union, that leadership involves a coalition of students and involves a coalition of people together. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more about how coalitions can get more done and own that leadership? Yeah, and I think we can all discuss that, but um, it is much more powerful to bring many different voices to the table to support an issue. If in the case of disability, it's only the voices of disabled people. I don't wanna say that we shouldn't be looked at, but I wanna to say to the extent that we can be bringing in many other components of people who are knowledgeable about a variety of issues to substantiate what it is that we're saying, but also because more people are doing research, which is inclusive of disability, or are doing work in education, which is inclusive, or dealing in legal rights issues, looking at inclusion. Um, it's a progression and we need to be, we need to be issue by issue, looking at who are the players that we need to be bringing to the table. So when we look at um, the LCC, the Los Angeles Community uh, College District, um, their leadership, espouses to be um, very supportive of a broad range of diverse populations. Obviously not including disabled individuals, even if they narrow it down to blind individuals, it is clear discrimination. And the fact that they are doing this, I think really enables us to see the depth of ableism that exists, that people who would not do this on other issues are feeling fine in moving forward, looking at disability as a different issue. And I raise this because I feel so strongly about it, but 
I really do think it is such a pivotal, pivotal issue. And if they were successful in moving this forward to the Supreme Court, as Andy alluded to a few minutes ago, this is not the court that we wanna be bringing these types of questions before. And it will not just have an adverse effect on disabled people, it will have an adverse effect on other minorities. Yeah, and Judy, I would just add, this is Andy, I would just add that um, we are having to refight a lot of civil rights issues as a country. It's not just disability, disparate impact discrimination or unintentional discrimination against yes. people with disabilities. Yes. Look at what's happened to the Voting Rights Act. Yes. Look at what happened, at, you know, affirmative action is being challenged in the Supreme Court. We really are having a fight as a country about whether we can even talk about our history of slavery and discrimination in the public schools. So this, this fight within the LA Community College District to me is part of a much bigger fight. You know, you could say it's a fight for the soul of our country, which is the way Biden put it when he ran for president. But, um, you know, I, I try to be hopeful. And I guess what, what I would say is we are going to win these fights, um, just like we won the fights with the California Department of Public Health. But I hope we can get to a point because of leadership at places like UCLA that we just won't have to have as many of them moving forward. And I, I do want to acknowledge that there's a fight going on at UCLA as we speak about how quickly the university can reopen and what, you know, who they can require to show up in person in classes, whether they're faculty or students. And you know, how that gets resolved to me is less important than which voices are heard during the discussion. I think one of the things we've learned during this pandemic, the pandemic has disrupted everything. It certainly disrupted our business model at Disability Rights California, but we have an opportunity as we come out of the pandemic to have inclusive discussions with all of the affected parties before we make a decision on something as important as who's gonna be required to show up in person when we're still dealing with the Omicron variant. So I think this fight that's going on on your campus right now is testing the commitment of the university to hear from the people most impacted by their decisions, nothing about us without us. And I'm hoping that, that your leadership is going to listen to the voices that have the most at stake and whether they're required to be in a classroom. Yes, and I think the other point that Andy made is it's many areas that are being attacked, voting rights being one. And certainly it's a big issue within the disability community, as are the issues going forward in affirmative action. So I think when looking at the importance of coalition, um, all of these issues impact many of us and the ability to work in a collaborative way to prevent um, these types of actions um, is very important, but also to ensure, like what is going on on the campus now, that the voices of disabled students, and I presume faculty and staff also, are being heard. And you know, Judy, uh, in terms of talking about the importance of working in, in coalition, I think it just can't be stressed enough um, what a an essential tool that is um, for a number of reasons. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, last year at Disability Rights California, we were one of the co-sponsors of Senate Bill 639, which eliminate eliminated or will eliminate sub minimum wage in California. And it was a tremendous effort and a tremendous fight, to be quite honest, to, to get that passed. One of our uh, greatest allies in that effort was labor. Labor is really strong and really powerful here in California. And of course they saw it um, as a labor issue, right? Everyone, everyone deserves to be paid minimum wage at least, everyone. There should not be any exceptions. So they saw that as, as a civil rights issue from their lens. Of course, we saw it that way. We also, of course, saw it as a disability rights issue. It was both, right? It is both. And that was what allowed us to come together and we really benefited from 
the political muscle and capital that labor has here in California. And, and that um, coalition and that collaboration, I think, was one of the biggest reasons why that legislation ultimately passed, which was not a given when we started, um, but it ultimately went through. So there's like the practical part of it, which is that, you know, we just have more power because we have more support. I also think it's so helpful because it starts to embed disability as an issue and a lens in the labor movement. I hope, right, that there are union members and people out there who maybe it just hadn't crossed their minds before. Maybe disability just hadn't been very high up on their radar screen. But when they got engaged with this as a labor issue, the labor lens was maybe their entry point. I hope that they take the disability lens and the realization that there is a disability angle to pretty much at any issue, right? Any progressive issue we might wanna think about, I hope that they are then more able to bring that lens, right? To, to anything that they might do in the future and to ask questions and to think about the disability angle. So it just serves so many purposes in terms of building power and solidarity. So it's, it, it's really critical now, I think, the work that we are starting to do at Disability Rights California. I mean, if you go back and look at the 504 demonstrations, one of the reasons that they were as successful as they were was because of labor unions. It was the machinist union that supported um, the 20 some people who came from the Bay Area in DC, who rented a vehicle, who had their uh, union members who went everywhere with us. And there were many other unions that were engaged. So. Union involvement, I completely agree, Vivian, is very important. And unions also have been involved to a greater or lesser degree because depending on the jobs people have, uh, where they may be higher incidences of injury on the job. So I think getting the labor unions to be able to, as they have been coming forward and being supportive of issues that are of concern, I think is both important and your right to be able to um, speak about it specifically. And I think also too, in, in addition to the additional muscle and power that that kind of intersectionality and I think coalition, working coalition can bring too is I think the power of shared frames and thinking about how, how a frame can resonate across different groups. And I'll give you an example. Um, not that long ago, I was in a, a space and a group of people um, that uh, it's a feminist club, right? And so I, the evening that I was there, we were talking about reproductive rights specifically and what's been happening right uh, around the country uh, on that topic. And one of the people who was talking, speaking in the Zoom meeting said something that struck me, which was, we are the experts on our own lives. We are the experts on our own lives, which means that we get to decide how we wanna live our lives. We get to decide what to do with our bodies. And it means that we get to decide, we choose. We, we decide what supports we need in our lives to be able to live the kinds of lives we wanna lead, right? This basic sense of agency, we are the experts on our own lives and we get to choose what that means for us and how we wanna move forward. We were talking about that, right, in terms of reproductive rights, but it, that frame also applies to um, transgender rights, right? Um, and especially to disability rights. It's all very similar, right? It's about listening to people with lived experience and giving them choice and control over what they need to live the way they wanna live. Um, I think it's, pointing out those bonds and those parallels and similarities can be really powerful in, in creating more commonality and a shared sense of, of solidarity across justice movements. Well, the night would not be complete for me if we didn't bring this home to healthcare providers. And Vivian, you've talked a little bit about reproductive rights. That certainly involves healthcare providers. Andy, you spoke about um, uh, physicians and healthcare providers bringing academic wisdom and professional knowledge to the table where there are ethical decisions being made. And Judy, you talked a lot about uh, unions and the 
the power of connecting different coalitions of people. So let me just say, um, I would love to discuss with you healthcare provider education because that happens to be a, an interest of mine. And there was an article out uh, last month by Lisa Izoni and her team that talked about the limited knowledge of physicians around the ADA and their responsibility to provide patients with accommodations in clinical practice. 35% of the physicians in that study said they knew little or nothing about their legal obligations under the ADA, and 70% did not know who determines responsible uh, or reasonable accommodations. So my initial concern is this is just a study of physicians. We don't have any study of nurses that parallels this. But I also wondered if there is anything we can take from this study, I mean, from our conversation tonight and this study that would help inform all of the health professions about um, stepping up to the table and becoming partners in really implementing laws that have been around a very long time and that healthcare providers are, are key to key to. So Judy, I don't know if you have thoughts about this or personal experience. It's a great question. Um, first of all, I think universities that are training healthcare providers have an obligation uh, to allow the people they're training to work in the field to understand what the laws require of them. Now, there are many people who are practicing who are no longer at the university. So the question is, what do you do with people who graduate in the past? Um, I think there are many different medical associations and other um, health-related groups where focusing on people learning about what 504 and the ADA are is very important. Obviously, also speaking with um, the people who are getting services from you, your clients, your patients, is very important. And the recruitment of disabled individuals to be working across the field as doctors, as nurses, as paraprofessionals, as social workers, as case managers, as whatever um, label people have. We need, just like we've needed to diversify these areas racially and gender wise, we need to, as you are doing, Lauren, really looking at what are the biases uh, to bring people in and what changes need to be made. But I also wanna say that I think it is critically important that disabled children, young adults and university people learn more about what these professions are and how these professions are not closed and paraprofessions are not closed to disabled individuals. Because one of the major issues that we face across the board is when you don't see yourself, um, you don't think it's something that you can do. It may be the exception to the rule, but you don't see the number of disabled individuals thinking they wanna be a doctor, they wanna be a nurse, they wanna be whatever it may be, um, because they don't see people like themselves. So I think it's really, um, we need to dig down deep. But I also think we need to learn from what we've been doing to diversify these various fields that we're discussing. So they are in fact more racially diverse um, and, you, and gender diverse. And you can see that. I mean, you go into hospitals today, certainly in urban areas, and the staff are much more racially diverse. You don't see people with disabilities. And I also understand that seeing people with disabilities is not the indicator as to whether or not there are people with disabilities there. But I regularly, including on some of the calls that we've had this week, hear people who are in the professions saying that people are afraid of disclosing. So we have to acknowledge that we need to see the inclusion of disability across the board as something which is essential. And that learning about the laws that affect disabled individuals and other minority groups is something that universities and associations need to take more responsibility for. My equal concern is that disabled individuals also don't know what their rights are under the law. And therefore they may be experiencing discrimination and not know whether or not it may be discrimination and not knowing what mechanisms may exist there for at the state or federal level uh, to in fact even discuss 
something which is happening to determine whether or not it may be discrimination. Um, the ADA was passed in 1990. I think a vast majority of disabled people, even those with more obvious disabilities, don't really know the depth of the law. And for those individuals who have not yet self-identified as having a disability, uh, they are much less likely to know much of anything about these laws. So this is Andy, if I can just chime in, Lauren. Um, we had an education equity summit this week and uh, Linda Darling Hammond was talking about kind of schools and building equity in schools. And she said that schools, the new three R's for schools should be relationship driven, restorative and responsive. And I think that those are great goals for uh, medical providers too. I think one, one of the things that needs to happen in medicine, whether you're a nurse or a physician or you're playing another role, is you need to build a relationship with the patient. You need to be responsive to what the patient wants and you need to help the patient restore their lives on their own terms. And their terms may not be your terms. Um, so I, I really think getting the medical profession to understand that the part of the practice of medicine is being a good listener and individualizing the care to the patient. Sometimes people call that patient-centered. Um, and that people who have lived experience with chronic health conditions are often better at that than people who don't. So if we can get the medical profession to recognize that lived experience is a positive differentiator and not a negative characteristic, that will change the culture of the medical profession. And more people like me who work in medicine with non-visible disabilities will be more comfortable being out and open with their conditions as part of their professional identity. I mean, I think the issue of disability being discussed across the board is very important because I do really believe that um, other communities have really made good progress in advancing the number of people who are practicing, making changes in the way training is going on, learning about cultural diversity and how to work with um, people, including patients, is something that needs to be um, modeled in the area of disability. It's not something which is new. What is new is that disability has not been seen as an equivalently important aspect of these discussions. And what that means is you have disabled people from all of the backgrounds who are also not getting served appropriately. You know, people whose first language is in English, um, how to ensure that um, not only are you looking at ensuring that the language that is being used is understandable, but it's also very important to understand some of the historical prejudices that may exist in different communities that may also make it more difficult for people to uh, progress in a way that otherwise they possibly could be. So the need for parents to be working with other parents, the need for disabled individuals working with other disabled individuals, and the need for healthcare providers who agree and see what we're saying as valid, playing a stronger role on their college campuses, in their associations, um, in their daily practice. Beautiful. Vivian, do you have to anything you'd like to add at this point or if okay, well, then we're going to go right to the Q&A portion of the program. And I would like to introduce Sharice Watts and Pia Palomo. They're going to be moderating the Q&A section of our program tonight. And I think they've got plenty to work with. Sharice, would you like to introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. This is Sharice speaking. I am a third year PhD student in the School of Nursing. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a Black American woman in her 30s wearing a black shirt and I have a Zoom background that's blue with a white UCLA logo. So I'll start off our questions tonight with one that was pre-submitted during registration by an attendee. And the question is, what do you think is the most important initiative for faculty and the administration to take to help advance inclusion in higher education? I think they need to speak up and out about it. And I think that in part is going on on campus, as I said earlier, 
because you're moving from a minor in disability studies to a major, I think that's very important. Um, working with students, working with other faculty, looking at what's going on at other campuses uh, where work that they're doing may well help influence work that you're doing, as well as the work that you're doing, sharing it with others. There is an organization called the Association of Higher Education and Disability. They represent quite a number of universities around the country in, in one area, like with students. That would be a group that I would reach out to because I know quite a number of the people in the association are looking at issues like this and would be able to provide information on what's going on on the campuses. And this is Andy, I would just add for one, one suggestion, just make sure that disability is part of every conversation of diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus. So if you're looking at the diversity of the board of trustees or the law faculty or the student body or any, any segment on the campus, disability is part of the diversity conversation. And you're looking for people who are comfortable self-identifying as people with disabilities as a positive differentiator and as part of your commitment to diversity. This is Pia speaking. So hi, everyone. My name is Pia Palomo, and I'm an academic coordinator in undergraduate education initiatives representing disability studies. I'm a Filipino American woman in my 40s. I have short black hair. I'm wearing a black cropped sweater. Um, you see a gold necklace around my neck, and I have gold rim glasses on. So I'm going to read a question from one of the attendees tonight. So I'm going to read it directly. It's from Camila Crafts. Apologies if I said your name incorrectly. So every step forward UCLA takes is a step taken years too late. Right now, there are students sleeping in the hallways of one of our administrative buildings, Murphy Hall, for 10 nights. Tonight, we'll make 11. Because admin cannot provide disabled students and students of color with equal access to an equitable education, Amidst a pandemic that is projected to be a mass disabling event, especially for POC communities, our own administration at the school that claims to be the number one school in one of the wealthiest and most influential countries in the world has failed over and over to provide the most basic standard level of access to their most vulnerable and marginalized communities. How do we keep an administration accountable that continues to fall short of providing the bare minimum of access needs to their students? How do we bring change to higher ed when institutional ableism is so deeply entrenched in every fiber of its being? Well, I mean, I'll just say that obviously there's not a simple answer to this question. And likewise, I think much of what we've been discussing is really um, aimed at trying to address some of the issues you're raising. It's very important that there are uh, that there are the that there is the ability to bring people together um, to talk about the types of discrimination that people are experiencing and to look specifically at who needs to take responsibility at the university level to address these issues. I also think that there have not been very many complaints that have been filed against universities um, under 504 or under the ADA. And there are many reasons for that, I'm sure. But if things are rising to the level where you believe discrimination is such that the universities are unwilling to address and it is having an adverse effect on students, one or more or faculty or staff, looking at what recourse you have, I think is very important. So I think it's taking concerns and moving them to action and really having them, as I think you clearly do, substantially documented and looking at what more needs to be done for action. Yeah, this is Andy. I would just add that the students that are uh, engaged in the protests right now are part of a long tradition that goes back to the 504 protest that Judy helped to lead, goes back to the deaf president now protest at Gallaudet, 
university, there have been key moments in the history of the disability movement where we would not have achieved our goals without protests. So I hope the students feel like they're part of that tradition and they're supported by this broader movement that has benefited from direct action and protest for decades. I also want to say that from the person who just asked the question, I do think it really is important to break some of these issues down and to be able to look at how to address them. Um, what's going on with the students, I think, is both in the tradition of what happens at the UC system. And I think there are many very important outcomes that will occur from this. But some of the issues that you're raising go beyond that. And I think really looking at what are the systemic issues that people believe are not yet being addressed by the university and what needs to be done in order to rectify that. And you know, in terms of, I think one of the big components of this question is how do we keep people and systems and administrations accountable? I wish that there were, as, as Judy said, there are no simple answers. I wish that there were a simple or direct answer for how to make change happen as soon as we need it, which is now, right? And how to hold people accountable when that change isn't happening in the way that we need, um, in the time frame that we need it. If we think about accountability in the long run, like thinking of this as a long game, right? Because in the end, all of this is a long game. There are just so many different ways of thinking about accountability and so many different ways to advocate and to press for systemic change. I would encourage people to just think about some of the different ways and think about what resonates most with you, your style, kind of where you see yourself fitting in because it's all an, an ecosystem and there are different roles that each of us can play, different things that we just have strengths at or that, that we're good at. Um, there are, of course, as Judy was saying, you know, there are complaints that you can file, there are processes. They, that's one way of spotlighting and lifting up problems. There's also like the protests. That's another way, right? Um, there are, there's the outside game and the inside game, right? And, and we need both. We need people to agitate and lift up and create pressure and push from the outside and maybe be kind of sharp about the things that they say and the spotlight that they shine. We also need people working from the inside, right? People who are part of you know, work groups and writing reports and making recommendations and are part of staff um, who, you know, again, from an inside perspective can be allies and can advance agendas in their own way. Um, we can look at legislation, right? We can look at groups and places in which um, we're looking at budgets and how resources get allocated, you know, on a large scale. So from the top to the bottom, from inside to outside, there's a role for lots of different kinds of advocacy. All of them, if we're, if we're able to work together in concert, can point towards more accountability in the long run. I know that's not satisfactory for, for tonight, right, for what the students are protesting about tonight. Um, but it's it's something to think about when you feel like you don't know what to do about today. You can take a step towards what you think you can accomplish together um, down the road. I mean, I think it's very important that um, UCLA needs to be able to look at the accomplishments it's made. Because I think it goes without saying that this type of an event and the events that have gone on this week and the work that's um, moving forward in disability studies and in revising or, or reviewing admissions criteria for disabled students in certain areas, on and on, those are all very positive things. The reason why I keep speaking about needing to have an inventory about what it is that people want to have changed, because then you can also be looking at what the problem is and looking at what needs to be done, setting up plans for making things happen and timelines with the appropriate people in the university who can make change. Um, you know, you've got this, the faculty senate, 
and all these different bodies within the university and um, people who are engaged in not being satisfied with what's going on for faculty or staff or students. Those are mechanisms also that I think need to be utilized. But it's very important, I think, to um, be cognizant of the hard work that has been done and the changes that have been made as you continue to move forward to fight for more changes because it's not where we need to be. One other question um, from an audience member, um, Amy Kenny. She says, I am a disabled woman and UC lecturer. I have experienced so much ableism in higher ed and advocate for my students to not experience the same, but it's frustrating and tiring. What gives you hope about this phase of the movement? A, that you're speaking about it. B, that you need to go back and look at what more could be done. Um, because the intent should not be that you or the other students are burning out. So I get back to what I was saying earlier. Who have you spoken to on campus relating to violations that you think are happening? Contacting the Department of Justice, Department of Education in Washington, D.C., in the state of California, looking at laws that you believe are being violated. Look towards mediation. Look towards various things. But don't feel hopeless. And this is Andy, I would just say what gives me hope is people like Simone Biles talking about her experience with mental illness. I, I feel like there's a cultural conversation happening. We're in a cultural moment where part of being a good leader is being vulnerable. Um, it's certainly, it, it's a counter version of leadership to the toxic leadership that we saw from the prior uh, administration. And I guess my hope is that as leaders become more vulnerable, their vulnerability will resonate with the people that they're leading and they'll realize that it, it's an important leadership asset and it will open the door for more opportunities for people with disabilities to be their whole selves in leadership roles. So. Maybe it's hard to see that on the when you're a student and you're or you're a lecturer and you're experiencing ableism, but I I would say we all have to find reasons to hope. I think it's a great question, and we all need to be on the lookout for the things that give us hope and lift them up. And for me, it was Simone Biles, but I think everybody will have their own their own source of hope. I mean, I think about Simone Biles. It's not just that she took like amazing actions to be so public. But I think because of who she is, it has had ripples effects. And that ripple effect, I think, is very important. Um, and looking at the whole issue of the types of pressure that many athletes are going through and the adverse effect it has on them. Um, so I would say it's her bravery to come forward and do what she did under her terms which I think was really important. She dropped out, but not completely. She came back in, she's speaking up, and there are others that are doing that. I couldn't agree more with what Judy and Andy was, have been saying about just the norms shifting, right? The normalizing of it. It's, we still have a very long way to go, but it just feels like there's been a sea change in the last few years where for some reason, this is just far more doable. And more importantly, when people like Simone Biles or other athletes or, or other very visible people come out now and show their vulnerability and name their disability and identify their needs and their boundaries, um, they're no longer just routinely shushed, right, or pushed aside. It seems like more and more there's there's sort of a, a spring of support. There are always people who come out, right? The Me Too movement is called Me Too for a reason. Now, because of just the way society is shifting, because of technology for so many reasons, now when someone comes out and takes one of those brave steps, um, it, it's a sign, it's a signal and a beacon and it empowers people to say, me too. I thought I was alone, right? I, like, I see what you're doing and, and that's, and it brings again, a sense of collective identity and, 
and power and it just makes it more of a norm in society. And I guess the, the, the other thing, major thing that brings me hope personally, um, because, right, it's so important. Times are grim. <laughs> Things are hard. There are so many, so many challenges everywhere we, we look today. And one of the things that gives me hope is thinking about all the previously impossible things that have actually happened in the last three years, for good and for bad, right? Like so many things in the last three years that have happened have just completely been upended. And although that can be scary, if you think about it in one way, it's also very freeing. Like, why not, right? All these things that in past years where we thought, that's just impractical, that's too extreme, that could never happen. Let's be incremental, let's be practical. It doesn't matter anymore. In some ways, so many impossible things have already happened, why not? Why not like bring in and, and pursue goals and, and dreams and, and programs that may have seemed impossible a few years ago? Maybe they're not impossible anymore. So that's what I try to focus on, you know, when, when things, things get hard. I would love to have more questions, but I have a feeling we've come to the end of our time together. And I just wanted to say thank you again so much to the people we've enjoyed our conversation with. That includes the people in chat, the people who submitted Q&A, most important to Judy Human, to Andy Imperato, to Vivian Hahn, to Pia and Charisse who helped facilitate the Q&A. Um, I am so grateful we've had this conversation and I love the fact that we ended on hope. Um, we've talked about the ecosystem that builds hope and how it involves every single one of us individually and in coalition doing our part to lift up this conversation, to persist in talking about it, and to find ways either incrementally or all at once to make change. And I have great hope for the future. And I'm so grateful that you all joined us tonight.